Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Our guest today is a legend within the arena of global investors. We're honored to be welcoming back to the show Mr. Jim Rogers. He was the co-founder of the Quantum Fund. He is a best-selling author, and he continues to hold the international reputation of being one of the top most successful financial investors in the world. Jim has been predicting our current financial crisis for the past several years, and he is an expert at thriving in bear markets. He's coming to us to Today from Singapore, and we're so privileged to have him here to share his incredible knowledge and his Nostradamus-like predictions. Jim, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am delighted to be here, Michelle. I hope things are great in San Diego. They seem to be okay here in Singapore. Yes, sir. Everything is going fine, relatively speaking, in terms of the world. Now we are thrilled. To have about one thing. Yes, I. What I have said yes. is often is that the next bear market is going to be the worst in my lifetime. I've also said I don't know when it's coming. You know, you should watch things like Portfolio Wealth Global to find out when it's coming. But all I said was in 2008, we had a huge problem because of too much debt. The next time, it's going to be worse because the debt has gone higher and higher and higher. It's a fairly simple statement. I'm surprised it got so much attention. Right. Well, you know, um, a lot of people have said it. No one ever really pinpointed it except you. The last time you were on the show was in September. And if um, everybody wants to go back and view that program, he actually said it was coming. It was coming fast. Um, secondly, he predicted a global cryptocurrency which I don't know if you remember our conversation on that one, Jim, but you said that one was coming almost immediately. And I was like, no, 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 because here in the United States, we don't see anything like that on the ground as of yet. And then, Jim, lo and behold, in the um, coronavirus stimulus package, it was held a digital dollar, everyone, and a digital wallet. Now, I want to say right now that that terminology was taken out of the bill before it was signed into law. But it gives everyone some perspective on the fact that, Jim, the infrastructure is, in fact, in place. You were right, and I want to talk about this. I'm delighted to, but let's be sure you understand. When I said there's go the money's going to be on the computer, which I said over and over and over again, uh, it's going to be government money. It's not, I wish it weren't, but, you know, it's already in China. You cannot use money in China. You can't buy ice cream. You can't take a taxi with money. It's all on the computer already. It's already happening in some countries and it's going to get, I don't like it. Governments like it, Michelle. It gives them more control, more knowledge. They'll know everything you do, but it's going to happen. Jim, it was just such an incredible prediction at the time. And um, so the fact that they actually had that item in the stimulus bill. Again, I don't want to frighten everybody. Um, it was taken out. However, for them to have had it in and our president to be ready to sign that bill within days, that means the infrastructure is in fact in place. Does that mean a global currency or um, what are we looking at? Break it down for us. Well, each, all our money, all, to repeat, already in China and some parts of Asia, it's already happening. I tried to buy an ice cream in Beijing a few months ago. I couldn't buy it. The woman couldn't take money. She gave me the ice cream in the end. She, I had money. I had money, but she couldn't take money. She felt sorry for this poor foreigner, so she gave me the ice cream. I wish I'd been buying a Mercedes or something, something worthwhile. So it is already happening. It's going to be government money. Now, your main question was what kind, was probably going, governments are probably going to come up with some kind of international money to settle international debts. We have SDRs now, strategic drawing, uh, drawing rights, which are not, not used at all, but with the computer and with money being able to be on the computer before too much longer, your dollars and my dollars, US dollars are gonna be on the computer, but if we have to pay or if the government has to pay somebody in Brazil, they'll be able to do it electronically 
with an international currency or instantly ch exchanged U.S. dollars. It's kind of, as I said, Michelle, they're going to know everything we do. They love it. Right. And as I mentioned, you're like Nostradamus. I mean, what you say actually comes through. And um, you are one of the only people that I know that I've interviewed that that actually takes place, and it takes place so quickly. Um, do you well, see Michelle, this? I want to tell you, I make a lot of mistakes. You want to hear about my first wife? <laughs> <laughs> what a mistake that was. Oh, my God. <laughs> I make plenty of mistakes, Michelle. Well, I haven't heard one yet, and I want it. I want you to talk about what are the, you went into it a little bit. Um, the transparency of it all. Do you see any positives in this? Well, there are certainly part from government's point. You know, money is expensive. They have to print it. They have to transport it. They have to account for it. They have to protect it. So money is very, very expensive for government. So they love the idea that it can be on the computer. That it will save governments. Therefore, in theory, us a lot of money. It's also much, much more convenient. We don't have to carry wallets or worry about our money getting lost. You know, it's easier that way. The major downside, though, Michelle, as far as I'm concerned, I assure you, if I have a cup of coffee, they're going to know exactly where I had it, how much it cost me. They'll know how much coffee I drank in, in April. They'll know everything. And that cannot be good for the world. It's good for them, them being governments. Is it good for us? No. Okay. If you don't mind my saying so, you are part of what people consider to be extremely wealthy and extremely up there. And so people have the perspective that you might not be so concerned with um, the transparency of it all, but you indeed are, right? I am extremely concerned with it, for goodness sake, because it gives them too much power and too much knowledge. They already have too much power and too much knowledge. No, I would think that wealthy people may be more, we would be more worried than less wealthy people. Because, you know, if, if you have a boyfriend, Michelle, they're going to know it. They're going to know where he lives. They're going to know how much you had go to dinner with him. They're going to know everything about you and your boyfriend. And if you give him money, they're going to, if you buy him a shirt, they're going to know it. They're going to know what color it was. This is not good for you or your boyfriend. Or me. <laughs> right. Jim, let's shift topics just for a moment because I want to talk about the financial markets. Do you believe that the stock market was in a bubble in America? And of course, I know the answer to that question. But with the recent historic sell off, do you think that that bubble has now been completely popped? Where are we sitting right now? Well, the U.S. market went up 10 years. That's the longest in, in history that the American stock market went up and the American economy expanded without a setback, without a recession. I mean, it doesn't have to happen every few years, but it always has. I mean, for all I know, it's go 100 years. Never has, never has, never has even gone 10 years before. So, yes, we were certainly overdue. Stocks were expensive, very expensive. Some stocks went up every day almost. I mean, it's absurd what was happening with some stocks. So, yes, we were certainly in a bubble, certainly in a bond bubble. There's no question about that. So financial markets in the U.S., and let's talk about the U.S. Uh, since it's the largest and since we're both Americans, uh, the U.S. market was in a bubble. It has now been popped. There's always a reason that pops a bubble and that comes along. I, you know, in 2000, it was Y2K. There's always something. This time it was the virus. Um, is it over? I suspect uh, what's, what is happening, governments everywhere are printing and spending staggering amounts of money like has never been done in history. And so they're going to goose it up with all this money. I mean, the guy in Japan goes to work every day, runs the printing presses, prints money, and buys stocks. I mean, it's astonishing what the Japanese are doing, and, and America, too, soon, uh, everywhere. So this is adding to the markets. It will probably goose us up for a while, but it's not over, Michelle, if you ask me, because you know, a lot of damage has been done, but worse – huge amount of debt has been added to the system uh, and that's good for this month that's good for the election in november of 2000 
But is it good for 2023? Is it good for young people? Oh, poor young people. I've got two young girls, two daughters. Oh my gosh, this is not good for them. Not good for you. You're young people. It's not good for anybody. Well, now, I want to ask you where we're at because we had um, about a 35% drop. And um, there was a rally then a bit for about 20%, um, which caused a bit of a new bull market. But are these arbitrary 20% swings even applicable? Because it was caused by such a unique situation in that the um, coronavirus was so odd. Your thoughts? Well, the markets were very extended, very expensive. Just, you know, the U.S. market made a high in February. But you look back to three months before that, it went up on a tear. It, it almost had a blow-off kind of uh, bubble, a blow-off kind of experience. So we were overdue. Uh, if it hadn't been the virus, we would have been having a downtraft anyway. Nothing like this. Nothing like this, of course, because this brought out all the skeletons from the closet. Uh, in my view, yes, this is, I mean, is it real? No, it's not real because the virus is not going to last forever. But the consequences, the consequences are real. And a lot of damage has been done to the world economy. I presume we will recover, but nothing like what we had before, not for a while anyway. That leads us into my next topic, which of course is focusing in on the coronavirus on a global scale. Um, it's interesting that the economic impact seems to be much more intense than the scare of the coronavirus itself. In India, there are videos of crowds, Jim, that are waiting to get free milk because the supply chain is completely cut off. And when you watch it, they're so tightly packed together. They don't have any face masks on. They have no fear whatsoever of the virus. Um, Timeline-wise, when you look at the world and you look at this virus, how long do you think this is going to take for us to get back to work and to normalize? From the virus? Uh, well, some places, China's already opening up again. You're already some places, in Asia anyway, have it more or less, seem to have it more or less under control, at least at the moment. So some places are opening up already. Uh, Austria is opening up. Other countries. Uh, the U.S. is behind everybody else, unfortunately. But in soon in Asia, things are going to be re resuming their normal operations, and I hope that gets to the West. The problem is, for, the problem for Asia is that the West is now going into lockdown, and so their customers are in the West. You know, Europe's the largest economy in the world. If, if Europe is closed, it doesn't do Japan much good, or Korea, or China, because Europe is closed. But they, Asia's opening slowly. Europe, I presume, will soon. Austria already has. Eventually, even the U.S. will get it under control, I don't know, this summer, say. I have no way of knowing, um, but I do know the world is starting. And, uh, you know, Michelle, some people are starting to realize or take the view that the cure might be worse than the disease. Yes, it's horrible for people to get sick and horrible for people to die. But, you know, the cost of what is going on, uh, you're going to have many, many, many more deaths from other causes because of the horrible, horrible economic setbacks and the future debt. So many people are already trying to figure out how to start up, start up again. So the answer, the long answer is I probably buy this summer, but don't rely on me. I have no clue. Mm, yeah. The domino effect. Watch your show. No. They'll take <laughs> but the domino effect, Jim is just, it's, it's just, uh, it's tragic. Um, I want to ask you something about the sell-off because something that was very unique this time in this crash was that investors did not sell the stocks in order to buy bonds. They sold both and they kept their cash um, because bonds basically yield nothing anymore. Um, the rush into cash um, 
made the bond market almost extinct. And the only thing that saved it was the Federal Reserve stepping in to make it liquid. Um, is the fact that the Federal Reserve's response in printing huge amounts of money in order to do this better than the alternative? And what would the alternative have looked like? Michelle, in my view, no. We've had recessions for hundreds of years, every few years. Recessions are not fun, but and they hurt. They hurt a lot of people when they happen, but recessions do clean out excesses. It's like a forest fire. Forest fires are horrible if you're in them, but it cleans out underbrush, dead wood, and the forest can grow better after the forest fire. Now, it doesn't mean people that recessions are good, but it's not the end of the world. We've had them forever. Again, the Federal Reserve... The Federal Reserve increased its balance sheet like 500% between 2008 and the last year or so. Now they're skyrocketing the, the balance sheet again. Is this good for the world? Michelle, if I had said this to even 20 years ago, people would have locked me up because it's inconceivable that central banks could have done ever what these central banks are doing. And we're see, it's happening. We're sitting here watching it. It's inconceivable, and the consequences are not going to be good for the world. It will help some politicians get reelected this year, but it's not good for the world what's happening. So you feel like it would have been better not to print this and just to let the bonds fall and let whatever was going to happen to the market happen? Yes, the market is smarter than I am, and I promise you, Michelle, the market is smarter than the bureaucrats and the academics at the American Central Bank in Washington, D.C. Right. The, the market just would have corrected itself. It would have been rough, but we wouldn't have had these trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. Right? You know, in 19, the early, the end of the, after the First World War, we had a problem in America. In, in Washington, they raised interest rates. They balanced the budget. It was horrible for a year or two, but they cleaned out the excesses. And then we had the greatest economic decade in American history. You know, sound economics. Sound economics have been around for hundreds of years, and some countries have practiced them. Scandinavia in the early 90s, same thing. They had a horrible time. People went bankrupt. But after two or three bad years, Scandinavia boomed after they cleaned out the excesses took the pain, moved on, things were great. Japan in 1990 refused to let anybody fail. It is 30 years later, Michelle, 30 years later, and the Japanese stock market is still down 60%. They've had one lost decade after another because they keep propping people up instead of letting nature take its course and letting failure fail. 30 years later, the stock market's down 60%. Is that good? I say sound economics always prevails. Bad economics always prevails. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they just keep printing it in front of us, Jim. It's so frustrating, too, as an American and yourself as an American, even though you're in Singapore right now, to know that this is happening to our money and to know they're printing it into worthlessness, but we have, no one has the power to stop them. Why is this, Jim? Why is this happening? Well, because right now everybody says, oh, we must save. We must save Sally. We must save Bob. We must save people. And people get emotional. And, and I understand, as I said, recessions are horrible. You know, we all have to feel sorry for someone who loses his job or loses money. But, you know, sometimes... Emotions get in the way of sound judgment, and that's what's happening now. Uh, you know, if, if Mr. Trump went on TV and said, we must bite the bullet, we must, we'll get through this, don't worry. You know, he's got an election in November, Michelle. You know, he's a politician like all the rest of them. They don't care about my children. They care about November. They don't care about you, any young people. They just care about November. It seems like it's been going on so long. How many presidential 
administrations has this gone on through to make this happen to uh, to end up in such astronomical amount oh, of the largest debtor nation in the history of the world michelle i want to repeat we you we the united states is the largest debtor nation in world history no nation in world history has ever been as deep in debt as we are and washington just added another few trillion i mean history will judge don't listen to me. Just read your history books and in the future. You'll see. Right. Yeah, there's a quote by Mark Twain that says, um, history might not repeat itself, but it sure does imitate each other. Something like that. And he said it rhymes. History may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And he's right. I mean, it rhymes. Yes. It rhymes. Yes. Yes. One of the lessons of history, Michelle, is that nobody learns the lessons of history. You know, you look back 100 years ago, Britain was the most powerful, richest country in the world. And they started doing just what we're doing now. Britain is not even in the top 25 anymore. They're huge in debt. The value of their currency has gone down dramatically in my lifetime, uh, much less than your lifetime. So, no. The British are nowhere near what they were before, and they did exactly the same things we're doing now. We're not British. We do speak the same language, so we rhyme, but we're going the same way. Right. Now, Jim, shifting gears just a little bit into investing in this current economic climate, in your opinion, where are the best opportunities, both on long and short positions? Well, the best uh, opportunities now for me are the beaten down markets. I mean, China's down 60% from its all time high. Japan, I bought a couple of, I bought some giant Chinese wine companies uh, yesterday. Russia's destroyed. Transportation, tourism, tr uh, traffic is all down. Uh, airlines are smashed. I bought a Russian shipping company recently. So the th I'm looking at the things that are most uh, depressed, that have beaten, been beaten down the most. I'm not buying a lot, but when I've come across something that's down a lot, you know, and as I said, the, those markets, Russia and China, for instance, are down a great deal on a historic basis, and so they're probably cheaper than the Western markets. Certainly were cheaper than the U.S., which made an all-time high in February. I mean, this is April. Going down a lot, yes, but still, it's not, it's not deeply depressed like some markets, and I prefer deeply depressed markets. You know, Jim, some experts are talking about the fact that, you know, we mentioned there was a drop of about 35% in the market considering the crash. And they're saying that when this is all said and done, we could see a 50 to 70% drop. What are your thoughts about how far we will ultimately bottom out? Michelle, that's what happens in bear markets. When you say good, uh, go back. It's, it's simple. I mean, this, this is not an opinion. Just look it up. Bear markets usually go down 60, 70, 80 percent. Many stocks go down 90 percent in a bear market. I mean, you have some staggering losses in bear markets. This is not an opinion, Michelle. This is not some crazy guy uh, on, on your show. This is what happens. You can look them all up. It always happens that way. There are stocks that go down huge amounts, staggering amounts. Uh, some disappear. That's just the way bear markets work. I said earlier, they're not fun, but they do clean out excesses. I assure you, they clean out excesses when they happen. Wow. Now, um, I've mentioned a couple times that you have um, been predicting this massive economic crash, not just yourself, but many experts have been predicting this for several years and that it has been inevitable. The only question was what would trigger it. So, um, Jim, is this the big one? Is this the big trigger? So um, that we're really going through all of the pain that we're going to see? Or do you think there could be another even bigger trigger coming? Well, we're going to, we're having, we have had a very substantial rally. Governments everywhere 
have pulled out all the stops, printing, spending, buying, doing everything they can to get markets up. So yes, we are having a rally. It will probably continue for a while. Remember, Michelle, there's an election in November. You know, that's only six, seven months away from now. So especially in the U.S., they're going to do everything they can to get reelected. Is that good for my kids? No. Is it good for you? No. Is it good for me? No. But that's what's going to happen. But I would suggest to you that the bear market is not over yet. We may even have one more blow-off rally if they do something really dramatic. If the, Suppose they find a cure for the virus or something like that. We'll have a blow-off rally, uh, blow-off top, and then the bear market will resume because this bear market is not over yet. Okay. It's going to be the worst in my lifetime, Michelle. And Michelle, I'm older than you, so it's going to be the worst in your lifetime too. Right, right. Now, do you think it's going to be comparable to 1929? Do you think it's going to be much worse? Well, it could, it could be. You know, 1929 was caused because politicians kept making mistakes, one mistake after another, all over the world. So, you know, the rest of that story. Uh, at the moment, I wouldn't say this will be, it'll certainly be worse in 2008. I doubt if it'll be worse in 29, but it could be. I mean, we have a lot of completely, totally incompetent people around the world in governments. We always have. But especially now, the Japanese, it's un, to me, it's in, unfathomable what the Japanese are doing. And Washington, it's unfathomable to me what's going on. So they could really bungle this very, very badly. Mr. Trump and his guys love trade wars. They like war. Uh, so real war, I mean. So, yeah, conceivably, this could get much worse, and we could bungle it and have a, tw a 1929, 30s, 30s, be more like it, 30s kind of thing. At the moment, I don't expect it, but watch these guys. They're good at making mistakes. <laughs> they sure are. <laughs> um, I mean, not, just, not just America. I mean, Japan and lots of places. These guys are crazy. Korea. I mean, you look at some of the things that are German. You know, Michelle, even there are German cities now that have huge financial problems. When I was a kid, there was nothing more righteous and virtuous than German spending. Even German cities now have problems. So this is not just us. This is a lot of places. Jim, go, to, go into that for us, please. Um, what, do, what do you see globally? Well, you know that Illinois is bankrupt. You know that Connecticut's bankrupt. I'm starting with the U.S. You know that many cities and states and companies uh, in the U.S. that have got huge debts. America's the largest debtor nation in the world. The Japanese might even be per capita more indebted than we are because they just keep, the population is declining. The population has been declining for 10 years. The debt has been skyrocketing for 30 years. And they're just down there printing and spending as fast as they can. Japan's got very, very serious problems of facing it. Uh, then you turn to other parts of Asia. Yes, some of them are doing better, less bad, I should say. Korea, the 38th parallel is going to open soon. When that happens, Korea, the Korean Peninsula, will be the single most exciting place in the world for a decade or two. China's doing, it's making mistakes. But, you know, Michelle, in China, they still have interest rates. Interest rates are 2 3%, which is somewhat low, but it's fairly normal. The Chinese are spending money, but they're not spending everything in sight. I mean, I have to say that the Chinese have done a less bad job than just about anybody in the world. I'm, I'm startled, I'm impressed at how well they're handling this so far. Russia's a disaster. Everybody hates Russia, but I have, as I said, I'm, I'm investing in Russia now and have been for a while. It's hated so much. Uh, Europe, <laughs> I don't know if the euro will survive uh, all of this. I own very, very few euros going forward. I don't own much, don't own much in Europe. We, we discussed the U.S. a bit, 
maybe Venezuela is a great place to invest. But Michelle, you and I are citizens of the land of the free. We're not, a, we're not free to invest in Venezuela. We're not free to invest in Korea. We're not, or North Korea. We're not free to invest in Iran. There are some places around the world that are great investments, but because we are citizens of the land of the free, we cannot invest there. And agriculture, so agriculture, 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 agriculture. Agriculture is very depressed, extremely depressed, has been for a while. So agriculture continues to be a great place to look. You know how to drive a tractor, Michelle? Mm, not at the moment. <laughs> not, many tractors in, not many tractors in San Diego, are there? <laughs> Did you grow up in San Diego? No, Indiana. Indiana, Where? yeah, Indiana. We have tractors in Indiana. Well, I know. My grandpa was a farmer. Tra- I know, yeah. You never learned to drive a tractor? I never learned to drive <laughs> Go back. Tractors are going to be great in the next 20 years. <laughs> That's what I want to talk to you about, too. Um, we touched on this in our last interview, the fact that um, the things that are going to be most valuable um, in bear markets are the thing, the tangible items um, in uh, tractors, agriculture, things like that, food. Um, also, you know what? I want to mention something to you, and I want to get your thoughts on this. There was a news article that came out that Vermont – had said that they were stopping selling seeds. I mean, like fruit seeds, food seeds, because it wasn't considered to be a necessary item at this time. Don't you find that odd? Well, Michelle, I keep telling you, politicians keep making mistakes. Now, I think most rational people would say, what? Selling seeds (laughs) is certainly essential, vital, to the world economy in 2020. I told you, these guys can really mess things up, Michelle. We could have a horrible, horrible time ahead of us. And this is one of the perfect examples of the kind of things that these people do. You know, Michelle, the the studies show that the people who are good at being politicians, in America anyway, are the people who are good at playground in elementary school, in primary school. They were great at playground, but as far as knowing anything or learning anything, well, you heard. Seeds are not essential, Michelle. It was just the most absurd thing I've ever heard of, especially right now when they're talking about possibility of food shortages here and there. You know, it was a small article, but I, I just it caught my eye, and I just wanted to get your impression. Don't give up, Michelle. There are going to be more absurd things coming in the next year. There will be many more, all over, not just in America, you know, all over the world. There will be very strange things happening. You should be worried. Expound on that just a little bit for us, please. Well, you know, in the, in the, let's go back to 29, since you brought it up before. In 29, the American Congress was considering raising tariffs and starting a trade war. 2,000 of the best, of the most extraordinary economists in America took about ads and said, do not do this. It will be very bad for the American economy and for the world economy. Congress did it anyway. They had all the experts saying to them, starting a trade war in 1929 is going to be bad for the world. They did it. Well, you know the rest of that story. The market almost immediately collapsed as soon as it was clear they were going to pass this law. And then economies started collapsing. Banks in Europe, banks in America started going bankrupt. In in one of the largest countries in Europe at the time, the government made two failing banks merge. And so they failed. They got a big failure when they they thought they were going to (laughs) save the world by putting these guys together. So they had a real, you know, and then it became one of the largest banks in Europe, failing. Needless to say, that was the 1930s, mistake after mistake. So don't think we're any smarter than other politicians in history. We're going to make plenty of mistakes, too. I don't, I, who knows? Trump loves trade wars. He thinks trade wars are good. He thinks he can win a trade war. History shows he's totally wrong, but who cares? He's the president, and if he thinks it, and once it, it might well happen. And in 20 years, 40 years, we'll look back and say, 
whew, that was a mistake, but it might happen. What are your thoughts on the president? Well, uh, Mr. Trump did win the election. I suspect he will win the next election as well. Uh, who cares what I think? Uh, he's probably going to win the election. He's smart enough to do that. He's adept enough to, you know, that's what politicians are paid to do, win elections. He won the big one. He'll probably win the next big one. Too. It's very difficult in American history to unseat a sitting president. You know, if you're the president and you need votes over here in this state, you can spend money over here in this state. His opponent cannot do that. And that's why it's hard to defeat a sitting president. So I, if I were a betting man, and I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would bet Mr. Trump will win. You would. Do you think that Mr. Biden would make a better president than Mr. Trump? Uh, it, it, I, I have learned that I should not invest on what I want or what I think. I have to invest on facts and what is happening in the world. I cannot in make an investment because I think Mr. Biden would be better. I have to make investments based on what will happen. And I just got through telling you that Mr. Trump will win. Now, Mr. Trump can bungle it and Mr. Biden might win. Then I would have to make investments based on that fact. Doesn't matter whether I like him or dislike him. Doesn't matter whether I like Trump or dislike him. I have to base my investments and my life on what is happening in the world. I cannot let emotions get too involved in it, because otherwise I'm, I make enough mistakes. Didn't I tell you about my first wife? <laughs> yes. That was emotions. <laughs> you know, that was foolish, young hormones. No. <laughs> it, it was emotions and not rational judgment. So what you're saying is it's very interesting. As an investor's perspective, you see, as, as um, not a professional investor, um, I don't really look at things that way, but I can see that as a lifelong global investor, you look at things from what you believe politically will be happening, and therefore you can foresee certain ways that things may go. Very yeah, interesting. I, right. I have to judge I have to try to take in all the information, spin it around, come out with a d decision on the other side, and then act. If I let my emotions get involved, if I drink too many beers and make decisions, you know, it's not going to, I make enough mistakes, it's certainly not going to work. Oh, that's so interesting. You may say, people say to me sometimes, how can you invest in that country? It's a horrible country. I say, Listen, I don't care if it's a horrible country. Investors are supposed to make money. And if you invest, it might make it a better country. You know, you could be a much better country if you go there and invest and help change things. So please, try to keep your emotions out of it. That's so interesting. Because people do say that. They say, how could so-and-so invest in such-and-such -such or... Um, there's terrible things going on over there or, you know, don't they understand the humanity of it? But the perspective is if, if your, your perspective is that if you invest in it, you add money to the situation in um, and you have a little bit of influence that you may be able to make things better rather than just turning your back upon a situation because it wasn't right. Michelle, right now, Venezuela is a catastrophe in every way. The United States says Americans cannot invest there. Now, I assure you, the people in Venezuela would love for people to come there, invest, and help make things better. And if Americans went there and invested and helped make things better, the Venezuelans would say, wow, the Americans are great. They helped us, you know, but right now, we cannot go there and invest and help them and, and change things. You know, if, if you ask me, it would be better off if we sent the New York Yankees there for an exhibition trip, a baseball team, because the Venezuelans love baseball. That would have much more influence and help than boycotting and having sanctions and saying nobody can go there and nobody can invest. But, you know, I don't live in Washington. That's why I'm not a politician. 
It's just so enlightening. It's so enlightening because automatically you do think, well, that country's doing terrible things. So and so, look at this corporation investing all sorts of money into it. But in fact, you've just enlightened me into a completely opposite point of view. Well, and, and first of all, I, I know the U.S. government says Venezuela is horrible, the people are horrible, et cetera, et cetera. But I've also learned, Michelle, in my life, don't listen to propaganda because it's nearly all. Well, governments always have a view uh, and they always spout propaganda. I have learned uh, in my life not to listen to propaganda, to try to ignore it, because you go there yourself and see what's really happening, and you might come away with an entirely different view. I have learned, Michelle, if you get your advice from governments on investing, whew, you're going to go broke. It's, it's mainly <laughs> propaganda that comes out, and it's artificial. It's, it's dishon not just American propaganda. I mean, everybody, everybody. China, everybody, Japan, they're all good at problems. Russia, oh my gosh, some of the stuff that comes out of government mouths is astonishing. So please, try to learn. I teach my children. I, you know, I used to read newspapers from five different countries every day. They all thought they were right. They all said they were right. But then you get many different views, and you might figure out what's really happening. My kids... You know, they don't read newspapers, they get it on the internet. Uh, they know about international networks. You know, there's one from England, there's one from Germany, there's one from the Middle East, there's one from Japan, there's one from China, Russia, U.S. Watch all of these different points of view. They all say they're right. I assure you, CNN says it's right every day. Fox says it's right every day. But so do the Russians. So did everybody else. You put them all together, you might, you might get it right. You're more likely to get it right if you listen to lots of points of view rather than just one. So uh, try to learn about propaganda. Try to learn that it is nearly always wrong, whoever the source. There was a great saying, it's famous, in, in World War I in America, a, a famous American senator said it, but it turns out it comes from a Greek philosopher, and that is that the first casualty of war is truth. In other words, when war starts or when propaganda starts, truth completely disappears. So you must learn that. You're still too young. You learn that. Go back and ask your parents in Indiana. They will tell you. Your grandparents in Indiana, they know, they know that people can mislead young people and you know i mean it just seems like it's just all propaganda anymore <laughs> i was going to use another word but <laughs> well done well done your grandparents <laughs> did a good job your parents did a good None job. Of true. The of the earth they grew up they grew up having to work for a living so they know yeah now um i want to turn real briefly to china Real quick, Jim. Um, it's sort of a complicated topic because there are many people that are actually blaming China uh, for the entire worldwide scenario that's taking place right now. We actually have U.S. politicians that are calling for lawsuits against the country of China over this situation. Now, do you think that China is in a stronger position right now or weaker after the coronavirus? Well, everybody in China has lost a lot of money. This has cost China a great deal. They've had some deaths and some lockdowns. Uh, they are come, seem to be coming out of it, if you can believe what the, you see on the Internet and on the TV. They seem to have done a much better job of handling it than we have, we the U.S. anyway. So, yes, relatively, they're coming out stronger. They were all weakened. Everybody is hurt by this. But China seems to have done a much better job. And by the way, calling it a China virus, I mean, viruses, you know, in 2009, nobody called the H1N1 virus. We started in America. <clears throat> nobody called it the American virus. Closed airports, closed countries. So you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You know, and I don't know, you may not know, but in 1918, the world had this gigantic flu epidemic 
all over the world. Killed millions of people, millions with an M. It started at an army base, U.S. Army base in Kansas. Nobody called that the uh, American flu, even though it started American military. But you know what they called it? The Spanish flu. American PR was very, very good. I told you. American propaganda. propaganda. They said, this is the Spanish flu. Started at an American military base in Kansas. But American PR, propaganda, very, very good job. The world still calls it the Spanish flu. So all this is absurd. It's the flu, wherever it started. You know, and so far, China's done a better job than we have of handling it, if you can believe what seems to be on the Internet and in the press. Jim, it is always such an honor to have you on this show. I could continue talking. Um, You know, I want to, before I let you go, um, I want to ask you something. Um, Among global investors, it's no secret that you continue to carry the reputation of being one of the top in the world. And it's interesting to note that you have said that some of the most profitable times in your life took place in exactly this kind of a bear market situation. So talk to us about your mindset, your philosophies, and your perspectives about when and how fortunes are most easily made. Well, we were just talking about Asia, and it's remarkable. You know, Asian civilization has been around a lot longer than we have those of us who speak English, They're, they all have a word. Uh, in China, it's Weiji. In Japan, it's Kiki. I forget what it is in Korea. But it, what the word means, what Kiki, Japanese word Kiki means is disaster and opportunity are the same thing. And if you, and they've been around a lot longer than we have. But if you think about it, it's true. Whenever there's a disaster, it's horrible for many people, but there's also opportunity. I mean, if your house burns down, Michelle, it's terrible, but it's an opportunity for somebody to rebuild your house or to buy the property, whatever it is. And the Asians know this, at least they have words for it. We, I, if we have a word in English, I don't know it, uh, but that's the way I hope I have learned to try to look at life when I see it as, front pages on a newspaper of some kind of disaster. I also try to, you know, sometimes give money or try to help. But I also try to figure out, okay, somebody's going to benefit from this. Let's figure out who's going to benefit, where we can invest. And by the way, when you invest in places like that, they're very happy. They need money and they know it. You may be doing it because you're an investor and want to make money, but the people who receive your investments in a disaster area, they're very, very happy that somebody has come in to invest because it's a help to them as well. But if you can remember Kiki, Kiki, which is the Japanese word, and I'm sure that I'm pronouncing it horribly, but it means disaster and opportunity are the same thing. Try to learn that. Go back and speak to your grandparents in Indiana. They did a good job, but remind them of Kiki. Kiki. That's a wonder, That's actually a brilliant thing for everyone to remember, that a disaster and an opportunity are the same thing. I assure you, when you turn on the TV next time and there's some kind of horrible disaster somewhere, whatever it is, try to th- you're going to feel sorry for everybody. Yes, and you might want to help, and you should. But you also, then you should try to start saying, well, wait a minute, okay, who's going to benefit from this? Where is the opportunity? I told you, if your house burns down, it's horrible. But it's good for somebody. Somebody right. loves the fact that your house burned down. You don't, but it's good for somebody. The guy who's going to rebuild your house or whatever. Okay. It was a delight to see you again, Michelle. I'm very, very pleased. I'm glad that everything is okay. I guess everything is okay in San Diego. Everything is fine here in Singapore as far as I know. So hope to see you again sometime. Oh, absolutely. Sometime soon. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. In the meantime, watch Wealth Global International. Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> what did you say? I said, watch Wealth Global International. Oh, you mean Portfolio Wealth Global? What did I say? Yes, a Portfolio Wealth. Isn't that all the same? It's all about money. <laughs> Pretty much. Yes, it is, sir. Portfolio <laughs> Wealth International. <laughs> so we hope that your portfolio has wealth yes. in it. That's what we and need. If it doesn't, if you watch Portfolio Wealth International, you will get wealth <laughs> in your portfolio. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Mr. Jim Rogers, author, financial commentator, and legendary international investor. <laughs> for the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at Portfolio Wealth Global. International. Watch it. <laughs> Whatever. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>